So the last thing we want to talk about in chapter 8 is the role of wage indexation. And the idea is that since wages are so important um, to the costs of firms, that if we have uh, contracts or agreements in a large part of the labor market that increase wages automatically when inflation goes up, then we can kind of get a wage price spiral where, you know, we get some shock to the macro economy that leads to inflation, that leads to higher wages, that leads to higher costs, so firms have to increase their uh, prices even more, that gives more inflation, wages go up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is obviously not a big issue in the United States currently, where, you know, the role of unions is down, um, and, you know, inflation has been very low uh, over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, but it has been an issue in the past, and it's something that, that's important to think about, um, especially because we want to think about sort of the role that wages play in, um, in recessions, especially, right? Is, all right, well, what happens when wages, um, when the unemployment rate goes up during a recession? Do, do wages go down? Do they go up? Do they stay the same? And the fact is that nobody likes nominal wage cuts, right? So if you, uh, you know, if, if your boss comes to you and says, you know, I'm sorry, but we have to cut your wage, uh, that makes people very upset. And so really what happens is that firms tend not to cut wages. If we look at the data, um, even during a recession, the sort of most common change will be no change, right? It'll be zero. Um, and there'll be very few uh, wage cuts, even a recession. And, um, Instead, firms rely on layoffs. And I think this is kind of interesting. Now, obviously that has to do with the rules that we you know, make firms follow, which are different in the US than they are, say, in European countries where you might be more likely to see uh, wage cuts during a recession. Um, but I think the general idea with firms is that, okay, nobody likes to be laid off, but nobody likes wage cuts either. If you cut people's wage, then you still have the workers there being unhappy. If you lay people off, they're unhappy, but they're not at the workplace anymore. So that's a little bit harsh, obviously. Um, but I think that's the, the general idea behind the sort of US style of dealing with recessions. So we want to think first about wage indexation, right? And the idea of wage indexation is that um, if inflation increases, wages increase automatically. Now, for the most part, as I said, people don't have these types of wages. Um, but we do have things that are indexed to inflation, right? The, the most important thing uh, being Social Security benefits. And so every year, um, the Social Security Administration looks at actually a sort of very specific um, level of the inflation rate. And if prices have gone up, they will increase um, Social Security benefits. So indexation does happen. We also index, you know, tax brackets so that people don't get pushed into a higher tax bracket just because of inflation. Um, but we can think about it in terms of wages, right? So here we have lambda uh, as the proportion of labor contracts that are indexed. So it could be like anything from 5% that get an automatic increase to 100% that get an automatic increase. So it's going to be between zero and one. Um, and in that case, nominal wages will move, you know, one for one with the actual price level. If, uh, if inflation is 5%, nominal wages will go up by 5%. Uh, if inflation is 2%, nominal wages will go up by 2%. Now, <laughs> Social Security never goes down. So even if we have a decrease in uh, the price level, um, you don't cut Social Security benefits. And, and I would imagine wage indexation would be the same. Um, so here now we have our sort of more sophisticated view of, of what's going on where inflation is equal to lambda times pi t uh, plus one minus lambda times pi t minus one minus alpha times ut minus un, right? This is, as I said, this is not a huge deal in the United States, but it can be more important in other areas. So when, when lambda equals zero, so nobody has wage indexations, then we just have the same uh, Phillips curve that we had before. Um, but if it's larger than zero, then what we get is that the change in inflation, assuming we still have adaptive expectations, uh, is equal to minus alpha over one minus lambda times ut minus un. And so 
wage indexation in this case increases the effect of unemployment on inflation. Um, without you know, wage indexation, lower unemployment increases wages, which would then in turn increases prices, and that's going to be less of an effect, um, uh, or excuse me, it's going to be more of an effect um, with more wage indexation. Um, all right. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, nobody likes nominal wage cuts, as I said. Um, and what we see often is that the Phillips curve doesn't really uh, seem to do a good job of explaining the data when we have low inflation. And so here's uh, a distribution of wage changes. This is in Portugal, uh, but we could look at, you know, data from the United States as well. So this is in a time of high inflation and a time of low inflation. So the high inflation was in 1984, the inflation rate was 27%, uh, and in 2012, the inflation rate was 2.1%. So what you see is you see very few people with wage cuts, right? Those are these lines um, less than zero. You see a big group of people with no change in their nominal wage. Now, if you get no change in your nominal wage when inflation is 27%, you've just had a real wage cut of 27%. Right. But because people don't necessarily think about that, it feels better to have, you know, no nominal wage change than a nominal wage cut. And then we see a spike here around sort of 15 to 20 percent. The interesting thing, of course, is that even if you're getting a 20 percent nominal wage increase, right, you're still getting a 7 percent real wage cut because you're not keeping up with inflation in 2012. Right? We basically see almost nobody with a nominal wage cut. We see almost everybody with no change in their nominal wage, um, which means, of course, that they are getting still a 2% real wage cut because if their nominal wage doesn't change and prices go up by 2%, you can buy 2% less stuff at the end of the year. And then we see you know, some people with some smallish increases and then some people, you know, there's always a few people with very large increases. So we definitely see this big spike at zero, whether we're talking about periods of high inflation or periods of low inflation. Finally, in the appendix, um, we talk about sort of going from uh, this relationship I did a sort of waving of my hands um, in that video where we went from the uh, expected, the price level and the expected price level to inflation and uh, expected inflation. Um, and so here's what we do. So we started with this equation, 8.1. We divide both sides by uh, PT over, by PT minus one. So we get PT over PT minus one, and then PTE expected price level over PT minus one. That's cool because we're doing the same things to both sides. Now PT over PT minus one is the same as one plus pi t, right? So remember, inflation is PT minus PT minus one divided by PT minus one. So uh, if we add, you know, one to both sides, this is what we get. Um, so now we have one plus pi t on the left-hand side and one plus pi t e expected inflation on the right-hand side. Um, so that's what we get here in this equation. And then um, we divide both sides um, by uh, one plus pi t e and one plus m. Um, and we get that in the denominator here, and then the right-hand side becomes 1 minus alpha ut plus z. Um, now, we kind of, we're making a, a, a assumption here, similar to the way we did in the Fisher equation, that if pi t and pi t e and m are not too large, then all the interaction terms between the two are very, very small, and we can kind of ignore them. Um, so in that case, uh, the left-hand side becomes 1 plus pi t uh, minus pi t e, because that's in the denominator, uh, minus m, uh, also in the denominator. The 1s go away. We've moved the m over back over to the right-hand side, uh, along with the expected inflation, and we get our uh, equation for the expectations augmented Phillips curve. So you should always remember with these things that when inflation or expected inflation or the markup or really anything is really high, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent, then you kind of got to go back to our more full equation, right, of either the Fisher equation or in this case, the Phillips curve.